thank you all for attending today. We're so excited. This is kind of spontaneous, but we've been trying to plan it for a while. And uh, Cheyenne Johnson and I have known each other for three or four years now, looking at the nursing fellowship in the area of mental health and substance use and trying to advocate and get students there and participating. And right now, she's research leader at the BC Center on Substance Use and also um, brings with her a degree in nursing from Queens and a master's in public health from Simon Fraser, one of our colleagues down the street, and is also a certified clinical research professional, which we have been toying with doing a master's program in because I think that's an area we have many students very interested in. But right now, Cheyenne is the director of the BC Center on Substance Use Addiction Nursing Fellowship Program. It's Canada's only nursing training program. And um, she is an alumna of the program as well. Also joining us are Pauline Boone, who is a research associate at the BC Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS, and a Trudeau and Vanier Scholar at UBC School of Population and Public Health and Associate Director of the BC Center on Substance Use Fellowship and Addiction Nursing. So this was an opportunity to have them just share with us. We all know that a crisis is going on. The um, BC Coalition for Nursing Associations had a forum, I want to say, a month ago in December that came together very quickly and had over 150 people. And I know you participated and we had some folks from UBC School of Nursing as well there, but we're really excited to have you here today. Thank you for coming out amidst the ice and the snow. I believe we are recording this, so it will be archived, and hopefully we have some folks joining us from around the province as well, but welcome. It's good to have you here. Thanks so much. Well, we're really happy to be here, and Pauline and I are just kind of going to tag team the presentation. We have a few different um, pieces that we're going to present. Um, but just to get started here, um, there's no conflicts of interest for either of us to disclose for this presentation. And just a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit towards the epidemiology of the provincial overdose epidemic, uh, the role of nurses in clinical care, in leadership and policy, in research, education, and advocacy. So the first portion here is the epidemiology of the provincial overdose. And this is probably something I don't need to, to speak to in a room full of nurses that probably have their ear to the health pieces of the news every day. But um, over the last number of years now, fentanyl has been increasingly common in the news and in the media. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about fentanyl and also carfentanyl and other synthetic opioid agonists. In April of this year, um, our public health, Chief Public Health Officer, that's Perry Kendall there on the left, and our, and our um, Minister of Health, um, Perry Lake, declared a, a public health emergency to skyrocketing numbers of opioid overdoses. And I think it's a really important to know to the Naloxone teleconference call. So um, in terms of opioid overdoses and, and the, the Minister of Health and the public health officer actually enacting the powers of some public health laws around this. So it's a, a really historical point in our time. And um, I actually had the pleasure of meeting um, the, with the Prime Minister a few weeks back and with um, a number of community folks and, and nurses and other physicians that are providing frontline care around the potential and, and the ideas of calling a national public health emergency. Because as we know, this isn't something that's just happening in British Columbia. It's happening all across the province and also has been a, con a major concern in the US for a number of years as well. So people may have seen this before, but this is the coroner's data over the last 26 years. Um, the most recent data we have actually will come, January's numbers are going to come out next uh, week. Um, but up to the end of 2016, there were 914 deaths related to illicit opioids. And this is almost an 80% increase from the same time period last year. And if this rate continues the way that we're going, illicit overdose deaths could be the fifth or sixth leading cause of death in BC coming up for 2017 or 2018. 
And just to give a, um, a visual to sort of the dramatic increase in how quickly this epidemic has really taken over the, the whole province, because I think we often think of um, illicit over, overdose deaths being something that just happened in large urban areas, so in Victoria and Kelowna and Kamloops, but it's something that affects all over the province. So I'm going to take you through these graphs that go from 2010 to 2016. Um, and as the, uh, as the colors get darker, that's showing the rates of illicit drug overdoses increasing. So that's 2010, that's 2012, that's 2014, and that's 2016. And I actually don't have the most, this isn't even updated with the most recent numbers, including those 914 deaths in 2016. So I'd imagine actually more of this whole province would look red. So what do we know um, with some of the powers that have been enacted by the public health emergency, we've actually been able to track where overdoses are occurring and get a little bit more information. Um, so in 2016, we know that 73% of the illicit drug overdose deaths were among individuals between the age of 19 and 49. So these are young people dying. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Keith Ahmed, says it's like three 747s of young people crashing and dying in our province each year. Males account for 81% of overdose death rates. And when we look at sort of um, differences in, in sex and gender around addiction, this is quite representative. Most fatal overdoses occurred on weekends. 90% of them occurred indoors, which I think is maybe contrary to what some people might think in terms of Vancouver and the downtown east side. But, but most people are using alone or with others um, in a place of residence or indoors in facilities. 9% occurred outdoors, 1% we didn't know where they occurred. Um, it's so, so important to highlight that there's been no deaths at all in supervised consumption sites. We have two right now in Vancouver at the Dr. Peters Center and also at Insight. Um, and and none, have, none have occurred at the new drug overdose prevention sites that are in Vancouver and other parts of the province. The majority of the deaths are accidental. These aren't suicide attempts. These are people that are using drugs um, that may or may not have a substance use disorder or addiction and or using them recreationally and are accidentally overdosing. To come back to that fentanyl piece, um, this increase has been really partially attributed to the increasing proportion of drugs and the illicit drug supply that contain fentanyl. So some of the preliminary overdose data, this is actually from earlier in 2016, showed that the proportion of illicit drugs that contained fentanyl for those overdose deaths was about 60%. Um, this is better sort of shown through um, this graph, which shows the, the, the large blue line, uh, the increasing deaths of the, of the overdose deaths that include fentanyl, and the dotted line actually accounts for some of the deaths the overdose deaths that don't include fentanyl. So there's a, a bit of a downward trend in those deaths that don't include fentanyl, and fentanyl is actually skyrocketing. Um, some people may have seen back in the summer, Insight was doing a little bit of um, sort of ad hoc fentanyl testing. Um, that just very pure and drug screens and actually testing small amounts of drugs diluted in a bit of water and using sort of urine drug screen dips to test. And out of the 173 samples that they tested, over 86% of them contained fentanyl. And when they uh, accounted for those drugs that people had, had noted they were bringing into use that were opioids, this increased to 90%. Um, it's important to note that, that fentanyl and carfentanil isn't just in um, drugs that people obtain when they think they're using opiates. Um, we know from some RCMP seizure data, data that it's coming sold as, as faked pressed oxycodone and other club drugs in hero, as sold as heroin or fentanyl, but also mixed in other drugs like cocaine, crystal meth, and a few reports of cannabis as well. So a little bit more in fentanyl. Um, again, that's a 200% increase in the deaths between that same period from 200, 2015 to 2016. That's an average of 37 fentanyl detected deaths per month. Um, it's really important here to highlight that all, with all illicit drug overdoses, it's very, very rare that someone is taking just one substance, that generally overdoses occur um, as folks are taking more than one substance. And some in BC from some of the coroner service, we know that 50% of those involved cocaine. Alcohol was implemented, indicated in 38%, amphetamines in 34%. 
and heroin, oops, sorry, and heroin in 32%. So it's kind of that, um, it would be interesting, I don't think that they're testing for benzodiazepines in this because I'm sure that the benzodiazepine rate would be, I would say probably close to 70% or above, but generally that sort of cocktail of the three drugs that are really going to get people into trouble around overdoses are alcohol, benzodiazepines, and an opioid. Just to touch base in carfentanil, because it's something that we're hearing more and more about um, in the news this day. Um, folks may know that carfentanil, it's a synthetic opioid that was actually discovered in Canada, in Alberta, um, in the 1970s. And it's a synthetic opioid that's actually 100 to 500 times more potent than fentanyl. Um, lab tests in Vancouver in early February, this press release from February 1st, confirmed the presence of carfentanil in urine drug tests in BC. And just to note, too, this, again, isn't a problem that's just happening in Vancouver. Um, this actually just came out yesterday in the Times Colonist from Victoria, where carfentanil was found in a drug seizure in Nanaimo. So it's something that's spreading across the province and is, and is important to note because, because of the potency, very small amounts equal an overdose. So before it was like the difference between a few grams or something like that, but now it's the difference between like a molecule that can really um, have an impact on, on folks having an, an overdose or being at risk for that. Right. Molly is going to do this next part. Okay, so switching over a bit to the role of health professional bodies in, in dealing with the opioid crisis, this was a report that was released a little over a year ago by our group um, that was titled, Together We Can Do This, Strategies to Address the Prescription Opioid Crisis in D.C. Um, and it was signed by more than 70 commissions and public health officials in D.C. And the purpose of the document was really to uh, highlight some of the specific things that were happening in BC um, in which uh, healthcare providers and regulatory bodies could have a role in addressing the opioid epidemic. So for example, um, it was found using provincial data that 35% of patients on methadone um, were actually co-prescribed opioids, which can obviously be uh, dangerous in terms of posing a high risk or fatal overdose with additional opioids on top of methadone. Uh, and that has been shown by the fact that in our province, almost a quarter of all opioid-related deaths um, do involve methadone. It was also found that uh, over a 10-year period in our province, there was a 600% increase in opioid-related overdose deaths that were involving benzodiazepines. So like Cheyenne mentioned, uh, that interaction between benzodiazepines and opioids can be very dangerous and yet the benzodiazepines continue to be quite liberally prescribed in BC, despite a lot of the uh, newer evidence showing that the harm might actually outweigh a lot of the benefits of benzodiazepines. And also concerning was the fact that less than 30% of physicians were actually registered to even use PharmaNet, which is, of course, our provincial uh, prescription monitoring database. Uh, we don't have a number for other prescribers, nurse practitioners, but um, uh, it might be uh, equally as low. So it's, it's concerning that um, prescribers who might be prescribing these dangerous yeah, drugs are more dangerous than the product. Someone receiving a prescription from another prescriber or whether they're uh, receiving some of these other dangerous prescriptions. So, uh, these were some of the areas where it was highlighted that clinicians could play a role in, in addressing the opioid epidemic, coupled with the fact that despite a lot of law enforcement efforts, the opioid crisis was just continuing to worsen. Um, and another problem was that there was no single group that really had a clear mandate to address the epidemic, whether it be the College of Physicians, the College of Nurses, dentists, pharmacists, everyone seemed to be waiting for action. Uh, so this report really highlighted a few key areas where health professionals and regulatory bodies and the BC Ministry of Health could start to immediately um, enact practices to change um, uh, the crisis that was going on. So some of the key um, recommendations that it made were to have mandatory PharmaNet checks uh, for clinicians and pharmacies who are prescribing opioids, uh, stricter benzodiazepine prescribing, um, encouraging more evidence-based addiction treatment and access to that, and investing in education for health professionals and uh, evidence-based research in substance use. So this was one of the media reports that came out after this report was released, and there was a lot of media pickup, and one of the outcomes that came from this report was that the college actually then released these safe prescribing guidelines, which 
did include mandatory checking of PharmaNet before prescribing opioid stimulants or other sedatives. Uh, and then fast forward a few months and the Premier mobilized a joint task force to scale up the overdose response here in the province. And some of the tasks that the task force is mandated with are surveillance and monitoring, uh, treatment, harm reduction such as uh, naloxone and supervised consumption, as well as public engagement and public safety. So that's where we are now, a bit of a general overview of the uh, opioid crisis in our province so far. Um, and now we'd like to take some time to talk a bit about how nurses can really help to play a role in, in shaping the, uh, the progression of the opioid epidemic at the moment. So one of the first areas that we'll talk about is clinical care. And uh, one of the key areas where nurses have a huge role to play is in terms of advocating for, um, administering, and in the case of nurse practitioners, even prescribing evidence-based treatments for opioid use disorder. So I'm sorry if this, if this might be a bit of a repetition for anyone who was in the mental health uh, lecture last week, but um, I'll just go through a very, very brief overview of the uh, opioid management, uh, management for opioid addiction guidelines that our center has released. This was the earliest version that was, it started out as a regional guideline under Providence Health and uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, and it was later uh, reviewed and endorsed by the Journal of the American Medical Association and then just this week on Tuesday, it was announced that these guidelines will be expanded to become provincial guidelines that will be disseminated to clinicians throughout the province. So here in BC, I think we're in a really lucky position as nurses to be able to pave the way uh, in caring for clients with opioid use disorder using the latest scientific evidence. Um, and what makes these treatment guidelines really novel is that it really the first of their kind to describe the range of possible options for opioid use disorder treatment um, rather than focusing on some select treatments alone. Uh, so the guidelines are available on our new website which was also just launched on Tuesday, bccsu.ca. So you can download the full guideline there and we also host a lot of workshops for more detailed training if you want to learn more. So feel free to contact us about that. Um, so this is a diagram just showing a general overview of the management options for opioid use disorder. And you can see what's really great is that the, uh, the guideline focuses on patient-centered care and, and um, catering different treatment intensities to where the patient is at. So um, there are lower intensity treatment options up to more higher intensity treatment options where other approaches have failed. So at the lowest end of the spectrum is um, uh, interventions such as withdrawal management. So I'll quickly go through some of those. Um, withdrawal management is also known as detox, um, uh, where someone is weaning off of opioids within a relatively short period of time without the intention of continuing on a long-term maintenance therapy for their opioid use disorder. And while we recognize that detox can be potentially an important first point of contact for many individuals across the bridge to other uh, treatment options, a lot of the evidence is really showing that detox alone uh, has been associated with very high rates of relapse. Often uh, at 90% people will relapse within a matter of days after finishing detox. And the danger really comes from the fact that people, after they've detoxed, if they do relapse to using opioids again, they might just use the same amount that they were used to using before they had entered detox without realizing that the tolerance has decreased. And so that's where the high risk for mortality and uh, HIV transmission by injection drug use occurs. So really, if this is an option that your client wants to pursue, uh, I think the role of nurses is really important in emphasizing harm reduction, take home naloxone training, and that education piece about decreased tolerance. Uh, psychosocial supports are another low-intensity treatment intervention. These are things like contingency management or incentives to um, encourage individuals to reduce their opioid use, as well as psychotherapeutic counseling. So while these uh, have, can, can be beneficial, they're really uh, more beneficial when they're used as an adjunct to withdrawal and maintenance treatment approaches. And there isn't so far any evidence on any one best approach of psychosocial support. Residential treatment is another um, form of treatment for opioid use disorder that's very common in BC. Um, but to this point, there hasn't been a systematic review or meta-analysis to evaluate the best uh, method or, or to evaluate the evidence and support uh, of 
uh, residential treatment. Some of the early studies do show that some individuals may benefit from residential treatment, but a lot of the literature is quite outdated. And there again, too, there is a high risk for relapse for people who undergo um, residential treatment. Um, in terms of middle-of-the-road intensity treatment options for opioid use disorder, agonist therapies such as buprenorphine naloxone, also known as suboxone, or methadone, which many of you may be more familiar with, um, these are really where there's the strongest evidence for success for treating opioid use disorder. So I'll quickly go through um, those two. So methadone is, um, uh, comes in a liquid format that you'll see here, um, and suboxone is a tablet that someone needs to uh, dissolve under their mouth. And both of these are given once daily. Um, and when dosed correctly, these medications help to alleviate withdrawal, cravings, and to help prevent some of the euphoric effects from opioids. Uh, and both of these have been shown to be pretty much equally effective at retaining individuals in treatment and reducing illicit opioid use. Um, and buprenorphine naloxone is not significantly different than methadone at uh, medium and high dose. <clears throat> methadone, uh, one of the big problems with it is that it has to be administered via daily witnessed ingestion. So someone has to go into a clinic or pharmacy every single day to receive their dose. Um, and you can imagine for someone who's on this treatment for years and years, if not for the rest of their lives, that that can be a huge barrier to treatment. Um, uh, and it does have a lot of diversion potential. There's the high risk for overdose, which is why it needs to be witnessed. Um, so that's where Suboxone has uh, a comparatively much safety, uh, much better safety profile. Uh, there is the naloxone component. So if someone does try to, say, crush and inject the medication, the naloxone will kick in and uh, prevent a fatal overdose or prevent uh, that euphoric high that might come uh, from uh, potentially abusing that medication. Um, a bit more about the pros and cons of methadone versus suboxone. A methadone might, uh, it might potentially be better for people who might benefit from going into the pharmacy every day or clinics. For example, if they do tend to live an unstable or a bit of a chaotic lifestyle, some people might actually benefit from that routine of going in. It might be easier to initiate treatment for some individuals. Uh, there's no maximum dose. You don't have to wait for someone to be in withdrawal. Uh, no risk for precipitated withdrawal. Um, and it is approved in Canada for the purpose of pain control as well, uh, whereas Suboxone is not. But on the other hand, there is that really high risk for overdose with methadone, uh, particularly during treatment initiation because the, the medication has such a long half-life that if people are still using additional opioids on top of the methadone, um, it can be very dangerous and quickly accumulate in the body and uh, pose a high risk for overdose. Again, the daily witnessed ingestion is a huge barrier for patients, and it also comes at a cost to the pharmacy. Every single time that the patient goes in, uh, the pharmacy charges a fee for that in, uh, witnessed ingestion. Uh, it also can take a longer time to achieve a therapeutic dose, so uh, a month or more compared to a matter of days for a suboxone to reach a therapeutic dose. Uh, and there is much higher potential for many different drug-drug interactions and increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias. So comparatively, uh, buprenorphine naloxone has far fewer uh, risks and a much better safety profile, which is why it's really now being emphasized as the first-line option for treating opioid use disorder. Um, uh, some disadvantages are that it might be a high risk for uh, dropout for some individuals because the, there is that risk of precipitated withdrawal when people are just starting on the medication for the first time. Um, it might block the effect of additional opioids that might be required for pain treatment, and it's not uh, approved in Canada at this point for the purpose of pain control. But on the other hand, there is that um, superior, or more uh, better safety profile in terms of the decreased risk for overdose uh, due to the naloxone component. Uh, reduced risk of injection and diversion, um, and allows for safer take-home dosing because people don't have to go into the pharmacy or clinic every day. They can actually have take-home doses to take with them. Milder side effect profile, and easier to rotate from this medication onto methadone if, this, if suboxone doesn't work for that individual, whereas the other way around, it can be much more difficult. So that's another reason why it's being emphasized as the first-line option at this point. 
Um, and then just very briefly, I'll say there are a few other specialist-led alternative approaches when um, suboxone or methadone or any of the other options uh, haven't seemed to work for an individual. So these are things like slow release oral morphine or cadian. Um, there is some evidence that uh, uh, slow release oral morphine might be as effective, if not uh, uh, as effective, but perhaps with a better safety profile compared to methadone. Um, in some early studies, but a bit more research is needed, and, and at this point it's, it's reserved as more of a specialized treatment approach for individuals with very severe opioid use disorder. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the Naomi and Salome trials, which looked at diacetylmorphine um, or prescription heroin, uh, as well as hydromorphone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. So these are uh, also potentially beneficial options for those really hard to treat populations who have failed other approaches. Uh, but at this point, this, uh, these types of treatments are reserved for very select patients in a very specialized setting, setting at Crosstown Clinic in Vancouver. Um, so, and one of the other really great things that the guideline emphasizes is that harm reduction is a really important intervention at all uh, parts of the treatment spectrum, and that's something that uh, Cheyenne will talk about a bit more. Great, thanks so much. So, Pauline kind of touched on some of the, the aspects around more clinical care, and I think that the really purpose of the guideline is to really, for all healthcare professionals, not only for nurses, is to really look at not just kind of abstinence-based versus a harm reduction approach versus somebody in treatment, but really integrating harm reduction across that continuum of care and really meeting people where they're at and providing them with appropriate harm reduction interventions when and where they need it. I'm hoping everybody in this room knows what this is. Um, it's a take-home naloxone kit, and um, folks might, might know that BC was actually the second province in Canada to have a totally free um, to patients provincial naloxone program in Canada. So it's been going for a number of years um, and it's been quite successful. I have a slide later on some, some resources around this, but I think it's really important to note that um, our public health colleagues obviously have their ear to the ground on what's going on and these are these are what the kits look like now. They're, they're new and they actually include three vials of naloxone and three syringes. When they first came out, they just included two, but because the potency of fentanyl and carfentanil, um, folks that are experiencing an overdose might require at least three um, injections of naloxone to just give enough time um, for emergency services to come just due to the, the high potency of those medications. So I'll talk a little bit more, but um, I wanted to talk just briefly, I think, about a little bit of the evidence for take-home naloxone. I think we know it's really important but I think as nurses really speaking to the evidence in this area is, is really quite important. So this is a, a great study that actually came out of, um, out of the British Medical Journal in 2013. It's the first study to show a population-based um, improvement in health um, with naloxone distribution. So uh, just bear with me while I take you through this. I, I, don't, I didn't make this slide because I don't have enough PowerPoint skills to do this. But um, really what they did is they, across Massachusetts, they implemented this take-home naloxone program, and they actually studied communities that implemented it versus communities that did not implement it, and they looked at the rates of naloxone coverage per 100,000 population. So if we start kind of a baseline at zero, um, and there were there's zero change in opioid overdose death rates, and then we look at um, communities where kits were distributed um, 100 kits per 100,000 people, we actually saw a 27% reduction in overdose death rates. And when we were able to get at least 250 kits out there per 100,000 patient population, we saw a decrease in 46% in overdose deaths. So this is really like a super clear dose response effect. Like we need to get naloxone kits out there to everybody and that can have an important effect on overdose death rates. I should say this was at a time in Boston, in Massachusetts, where fentanyl and carfentanil weren't as potent and weren't really um, hitting the drug scene as much, so that obviously is a bit of a confounding factor, but we still need to get those out there. Um, if, if many of you have been following the changes around naloxone, um, I've been following it and there's been so many changes in the last year, it's actually been quite hard to, to keep up. Um, but in March of 2016, naloxone was made available in BC for the first time without a prescription. 
um, which is really great because we just need to improve access across the board. Um, in July of 2016, the federal health minister signed an emergency importation order that allowed the intranasal version of naloxone in Canada um, to come into Canada without Health Canada approval because that medication hasn't been approved in this delivery form yet to date. Um, in, in September, the RCMP, um, which is obviously our federal police force, are now carrying this intranasal naloxone version with them. Um, I could get into a little bit more of that, but really they're, they're, they're carrying it because they're saying it protects them against potential drug seizures with fentanyl and carfentanil, um, but we really need all of our first responders. <laughs> It's just a little bit of a funny sort of legalese battle with them, but they're carrying it. Um, they can administer on, on people that are suspected of having an overdose as well as protect uh, fellow police officers. Um, and in October, the College of Pharmacists actually deregulated naloxone from Schedule 2 to completely deregulated, which means that it's now widely available outside of pharmacies. So now without a prescription, um, you can just go up to a pharmacy and you can actually ask for a kit and, and pay for it. Uh, so this is just the Towards the Heart resource, which I just said is a really great resource for nurses and patients. So there's lots of information around um, nursing guidelines and standards for administering naloxone. Um, and there's lots of info to find here in this sort of, uh, the, this find a harm reduction site here. You can go and put in your postal code and they'll tell you where you can get naloxone kits all over the province. So that's a really great resource and there's lots of videos and, and other pieces that can help around training around take home naloxone kits and programs. Um, I thought I'd highlight here um, the real sort of importance of nurses and nurses in advocacy around healthcare policy for naloxone. Um, now in Vancouver Coastal Health and Providence Health, nurses can dispense take-home naloxone kits and administer naloxone in community settings without an order from a physician. Um, at Providence Health and Vancouver Coastal Health, the nursing educators have also worked very hard to educate all of the nurses around administering take-home naloxone and now it actually just comes up from the central pharmacy um, and nurses can provide that without an order to any patient that might need it in, in a hospital setting. And uniquely in Providence Healthcare, nurses can administer naloxone to a patient or a visitor if they have a suspected overdose. Um, so before that would have required um, an order, but really now nurses um, can, can do this without the order of a physician. And I should note here, like naloxone is probably one of the safest medications that we actually have out there. Um, there's some potential theoretical risk of a hypersensitivity, but that's never really been documented and it's much safer and has quite a short half-life of 30 to 90 minutes. And, um, you know, if, any, if nobody has opioids on board and you give it to them, even if they, you think that they have an overdose, nothing happens. So um, it, it's quite a safe medication and there's lots of nursing autonomy around it. Um, I always get asked, so I like to highlight here around supervised consumption sites and really highlight the role of nurses in helping to establish and continue to lead really the first, the first people in North America to do this for safe injection facilities and safe drug consumption sites. Um, so up at the top here, that's Insight, which people might be familiar with. But a lot of people don't actually know that Dr. Peter Center, which is the one down here, was actually the first safe injection site in Vancouver. And nurses there have done a lot of pioneering work. Um, in terms of legal battles with the associations and the colleges kind of going back almost 20 years now and, and have really led the way in, in harm reduction nursing internationally. I think in the role of nurses as well as, as we're continuing this national debate around supervised drug consumption and expanding access and also our colleagues in the U.S. are looking to potentially open safe drug consumption sites. Um, I think it's important for nurses to have the kind of evidence-based tools um, to have uninformed discussion around what supervised drug consumptions are and what they are not. Um, and these are kind of some common myths that um, people that might not know or haven't seen inside or aren't familiar with the downtown east side. Safe drug consumption places are places where people inject pre-obtained drugs in a supervised setting. So we're not giving people drugs, they're bringing their own drugs in. Harm reduction supplies are provided. All of the staff are there, are, are nurses or healthcare providers, and they're equipped to treat overdoses. Um, not, we're not just providing a space for people to inject, we're actually educating them on harm reduction strategies and, and education on safer injecting practices. And really the big piece of a lot of the 
evidence that's come out, and I'll touch on it in a bit, around safe drug consumptions, is it really can connect people into treatment. So there's some primary care services that can happen on site in terms of connecting people <coughs> into mental health and substance use treatment, um, wound care, um, access to other services, and as folks might know as well, detox actually has a, a that our insight actually has on site on top, which is a withdrawal management facility that's more low barrier than Vancouver Detox or some other facilities. So what super dr supervised drug consumptions are not, they're not a place to purchase drugs. Drug dealing is strictly prohibited. And when you go into insight for folks that have been there, there's kind of uh, people that use drugs, um, kind of code of conduct on the wall on what you can and cannot do at insight to make it safe for the community to be there. Um, it's not a place where the government, again, supplies um, drugs or to individuals. Really, that's a specialized care clinic for patients that need very high intensity levels and treatment of care, which is our crosstown clinic in the downtown east side. Um, and it's not a place where other people inject, inject you with drugs. So to, to be at Insight and to be at supervised drug consumption sites, you really need to be able to do self-injection. And for folks that have maybe seen this, um, our group was involved in some of the first initial reviews, um, evidence reviews of Insight. Um, and to date, there's been over 40 peer-reviewed studies that have found that Insight's been effective um, in decreasing public injecting, uh, reducing syringe sharing, um, increasing safe inject injection behaviors. Um, that really important piece for us, which is the increased connection into addiction medicine treatment um, and reduce overdoses in the immediate area around Insight. Um, additionally, these papers have shown that there's no increased um, initiation into injection drug use. A lot of people thought, well, having a place where people can go um, and, and kind of freely and safely lose drugs is actually going to promote youth to use drugs and other people to use drugs, and then that was proven to be incorrect, um, and that there was no significant increase in drug-related crime in the area. Um, so I always just really like to highlight that obviously this is an area that myself and Paul have kind of dedicated our careers to. Um, and so highlight kind of other models of care and other opportunities that nurses are really leading. And I think uh, addiction nursing and in the area of addiction medicine is really in, a, in its infancy. And sometimes folks liken it to the way we were with HIV in kind of the early 90s and late 80s around. We have a lot of new medications that are available. They're not, the uptake isn't fantastic. We're increasing, but we're really increasing healthcare provider knowledge, um, public knowledge around addiction, and really looking to move it into um, kind of a specialty area of practice of nursing that really requires special training and skills. So some people might know, and just to highlight, because we are in Vancouver, there's lots of services that are happening. And when I'm talking to nurses that are in training, I always like to say there's lots of jobs available in this area. Um, people might have seen with Vancouver Coastal Health, there's a new uh, clinic called the Downtown East Side Connections, which is actually opening below our new research space at 625 Powell, which will be a low barrier addiction clinic. It's mainly going to be focused on opioid It has an embedded pharmacy and really will make opioid um, agonist treatments much more accessible to people. As people might know in the past, it's been quite difficult. Um, you have to find a methadone doctor, stick with one physician. If you're transitioning from jail or other healthcare providers, there can be gaps in your care. Your prescription's canceled after three days if you don't pick it up. So really creating a low barrier place where anybody can go to continue their treatment and initiate and start. Um, there's also a lot of stuff going on with the Downtown Eastside Second Generation Strategy. Just to highlight a few things, um, there's some more, there's some new pilots of shelters to improve transitions from acute care hospital stays to shelter and to primary care. There's lots of improved services for women specific, including intensive case management, mobile health services, and actually a women, a women supervised drug consumption mobile harm reduction van where women uh, traditionally have sometimes said that inside and other kind of supervised drug consumption sites weren't inclusive um, for women. So those things are happening, which is really quite exciting. And sort of our home on where the BC Center on Substance Use is, um, a really new exciting program called the Rapid Access Addiction Clinic, um, which is an interdisciplinary clinic. I put up this picture here with my colleague, Dr. Mark McLean, and my colleague who's a nurse, um, Sharif, there with the patient. And it's a clinic that's really helping to bridge emergency from acute care stays so that patients either come in from emergency, they can also walk in off the street, or patients that are in St. Paul's in acute care can be seen and stabilized in an outpatient setting and then transferred into primary care. 
Um, I also like to really highlight, just because I, I've been to Boston uh, quite recently, and a, they're doing a lot of very innovative stuff around nursing-led models of care. Um, that I think in Canada, we're doing a lot, of, we're doing some of this work sort of behind the scenes if people have been to a methadone clinic or sort of seen like how community health centers are run around sort of addiction treatment and really the very important role of nurses. Um, but I think we are to some extent underutilizing nursing roles and really undervaluing them in the healthcare system for patients with addictions. Um, and so it's our hope to really learn from very successful models um, of care in the U.S. Uh, most notably this OBOT model, which stands for outpatient buprenorphine office treatment or outpatient sort of suboxone treatment, um, which is a very unique model that actually has a nursing care manager surrounded by five nurses um, that care for a number of patients with addiction, primarily just with suboxone. They also use extended release naltrexone or Vivitrol, which is an injectable um, opioid antagonist, which actually isn't available in Canada. I can I can answer questions if people have them about that. Um, they're connected into primary care through these clinics, um, but once they start their, their treatment, so once they see the, the nurse case manager, once they see the primary care provider and they pick between going on Suboxone or going on Vivitrol, um, they're totally case managed by the nurse and they only see their primary care doctor every four months. And five nurses with one nurse case manager can care for 700 patients in these clinics with an opioid addiction with Suboxone. So in BC and in Canada, we really need to be looking for nursing expertise because this is a safe medication Nurses have the expertise to manage this medication with that close link into primary care. Um, I also like to highlight it's not just sort of about treating the uh, substance use disorder as it's developed, but also there's nurses involved in very innovative academic type detailing programs. Again, this is one coming out of Boston at Medical Center um, that's a program called Talk Care. Um, which really looks at physicians that have unsafe prescribing practices around opioids and benzodiazepine and sort of lets the nurse be the bad cop in terms of approaching the patient with different strategies to manage their chronic pain and ways that they can work together um, to try new things for chronic pain and to sort of help um, treat substance use disorders if they have developed or prevent substance use disorders or increase tolerance and withdrawal and, and other pieces that can come with long-term opioid treatment for chronic pain. Well, I know we just have a few minutes left, and I'd like to leave some time for questions. But uh, just finishing up with how nurses can help to uh, play a role in the opioid epidemic in terms of leadership and policy. Oh, actually, please tell me, sorry. Oh, it's just tell me. Okay. Um, so some more sort of exciting stuff that's coming on the horizon. Many people might know that um, in July, nurse practitioners are now able to prescribe controlled substances. Um, and earlier this year, um, nurse practitioners were able to continue prescriptions of buprenorphine, naloxone, or suboxone, but not actually initiate. We're working very closely with CRNBC to develop sort of the educational component behind prescribing opioid agonist treatments like suboxone and, and methadone. And it's hope, the hopes are that sometime later in 2017, nurse practitioners will have their scope of practice kind of amended to increase in for initiation maintenance of Suboxone and also for Methadone. Um, just to highlight here, there's kind of an ongoing um, uh, piece that nurses can kind of volunteer to have to be a part of a focus group. So if you're interested or know colleagues that might be interested in contributing to this work, um, you can contact Rebecca there um, at CRNBC. Um, Again, Pauline highlighted some of the important pieces around support recovery and that we just don't really have good evidence. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, support patients um, that might need it into going into supportive recovery or residential treatment. We just need a little bit more research around it. And earlier this year, through some of the joint task force work, uh, work as well, um, BC's expanded some access to recovery supports to um, combat the overdose crisis. And I think traditionally in the addiction treatment system, it's kind of been the physicians and the nurses over here with sort of evidence-based care and kind of abstinence-based recovery people on this side. And really for the first time, we're kind of bringing everyone together. And when we have people in the same room, really everyone's goal is the same. And it's to treat patients and to treat their patients and, and families um, in an evidence-based way and provide them with the most safe and effective care that they can have. Really exciting around some policy changes is as of February 1st, opioid agonist treatments are covered under Plan G. So for people that don't know what that is, it's kind of the, the mental health kind of coverage plan um, that's for lower income people. Um, 
So now PharmaCare Income Assistance Plan G and Fair PharmaCare fully covers the generic of buprenorphine naloxone as well as methadone, which is dispensed as methadones. Um, and I think it's really important here, and nurses also play an important role around policy advocacy to, to reduce the costs and reduce barriers for access to treatment for people with substance use and promote transitions. Before this came into effect, you know, there was, if you were on methadone and on income assistance, there was very little incentive to, to remain on methadone and go into sort of a low paying job where you'd actually be paying out of your pocket for methadone because you wouldn't be on fair pharmacare and a significant amount of your income thinking about, it's about, can be about uh, 10 to $17 a day for methadone, um, including the daily witness ingestion fees. And that's a lot of money for most folks, especially with a low income. So this is quite exciting. And uh, Suzanne talked a little bit about this, but um, in December, I had the pleasure of sitting on the panel for the Coalition of Nursing Associations to talk about this. Um, you can contribute through ARNBC, but there's a lot of solutions that have been really identified around ways that nurses can provide advocacy and support for nurses that are here right now, providing a lot of the frontline work and are, are really burnt out and, and experience a lot of emotional and workplace kind of trauma related to the toll that this is taking on their patients, their families, and really the community in general. Um, so just finishing up on how nurses can address the opioid epidemic in research, education, and advocacy. Um, I think nurses are really in a really special place to be at the front line of care, and often we're the, the health professionals that spend a lot of like, most time with patients a lot of the time. So we hear a lot of the stories and we have, I think, a lot of valuable clinical observations that maybe some other health professionals might not have to that same extent. So translating those clinical observations into really meaningful research questions, I think, is a way nurses can play a huge role. And of course, CBC Nursing is a great example of how uh, some of that research is being um, put out. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more room for nurses to contribute that way. Uh, and same as vice versa. So we are individual, we are as nurses in a position to be able to translate research and the latest science and evidence about addiction treatment back to our patients and provide that education and to advocate for models of care that are evidence-based uh, and innovative. Um, and also, uh, oh sorry, uh, just going back, this was also from the announcement on Tuesday that uh, the province is announcing more funding for addictions research. So again, a very exciting place to be if you're interested in both substance use and uh, the research field. Uh, Shannon and I are very excited to be leading the Addiction Nursing Fellowship at the BC Center for Substance Use. So it's a one-year fellowship that accepts four positions in nursing. This year we may actually be taking five nurses, which is very exciting, and we hope that we'll just continue to grow the program. So these are often uh, positions for people who have already been in practice working with the population for a couple years, but we're hoping to introduce perhaps an entry to practice stream eventually. Um, and uh, throughout the one-year training program, nurses go through various uh, um, placements throughout Vancouver and throughout BC in different addiction treatment settings, uh, as well as go through a lot of didactic teaching and, and education uh, in an interdisciplinary setting with physicians and, nurse and social workers. You're all in the same room together learning about the latest evidence in uh, addiction care. Um, so the fellowship is we just recruited uh, the next cohort, but we will in the fall start recruiting for the 2018 cohort. So if you're interested in applying, please feel free to reach out to us or if you know anyone else who might be interested. Uh, there's also a lot of other educational opportunities. So Cheyenne will be leading a CNA webinar series on um, addiction uh, competencies as well as uh, will be at the BCNU um, Member Education Day in May. We'll be uh, holding some workshops to go through the opioid use disorder guidelines in a bit more detail and work through some case studies to see how nurses can play a role in, in uh, opioid addiction treatment. Um, and just a piece about media and advocacy. So um, nurses, I feel, are often left out of the bigger conversation that's happening uh, in the public about uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, often on the radio, you'll hear the voice of a physician being the voice, voice of the healthcare professional side. Um, every so often, you'll hear other voices, such as CBC did this spotlight on first responders, such as firefighters or ambulance workers, and how it's affecting them. But I was a bit surprised to see that nurses weren't uh, highlighted in that uh, piece. 
nor were the voices of families or actual people who use drugs themselves. So I think we have a huge role to play in, um, in sharing our perspectives of what it's like as well as advocating for the voices of our patients to be heard as well. And these are just some examples of uh, op-eds that we've contributed to um, and other um, UBC nursing graduates such as Megan Tumas wrote one here with uh, Bernie Pauly and Mary Lou Gagnon. Um, so uh, sharing our perspectives in the media and contributing to that public discussion I think is an important role of nurses as well. And uh, like Cheyenne mentioned, there's some more informal ways we can kind of uh, advocate for our patients through discussions with policymakers and the wider debate about what the future of drug policy in Canada looks like in terms of potentially legalizing, legalization and other, other issues like that. Uh, so in summary, we've just gone through a bit of the epidemiology of the provincial opioid epidemic, the role of nurses in clinical care, treating opioid use disorder using the latest guidelines, uh, harm reduction using the lock zone, supervised injection sites. Uh, we've talked a bit about some of the local and re regional initiatives, uh, such as all the stuff that's happening with the BC Center for Substance Use. Um, innovative care settings such as nurse-led clinics in the United States that we can learn from and potentially implement here in Canada and BC. We've talked a bit about leadership and policy, uh, some of the changes that are happening with MP describing, pharmacare coverage, and the Nursing Association action on uh, the opioid crisis and also the role of nurses in uh, education, such as the fellowship that we're leading and, and some of the other curriculum discussions that are happening through UBC Nursing and elsewhere. Um, workshops, webinars, there's lots of opportunities for nurses here, and it's a really exciting place for uh, nurses to be involved in if you're thinking about what area you'd like to focus your career in. I think uh, substance use is a really uh, exciting area at this time. Do you have anything to add, Cheyenne? No, I think that's it. Okay. Well, contact information, so please feel free to call us or uh, email us if you have any questions for the fellowships or, or any information that we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an exciting discussion. I think we have just a few minutes if there are some dire questions to be had or other thoughts. I, the statistics are startling and dismaying, and it's really good to see that nursing is a part of the discussion and the dialogue. Getting the voice out there and what nurses see and are capable of is huge. Any other questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, sort of a uh, helps us with our <laughs> um, I'm just curious, what do, you, what do you feel are the priority directions in policy in regards to uh, managing this uh, overall uh, crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, so the is, is this for, are you, are you and David Byers? Is that the PhD stream stuff? Yeah. Or, okay. <laughs> I think you might have warned me that there might be some people here about that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, if you look at sort of the task group areas, I think that kind of breaks it down in sort of, sort of the, key, the key pieces because it's obviously such a large issue that touches every sort of area of society and we can't just look at it through a health lens. So I think the interdisciplinary piece, but I mean, from my perspective, obviously, like with a very focus on health and treatment, it's really like we have this amazing um, evidence base and science, but we there's a huge gap in the clinical practice. So we really need to be working. I think in British Columbia specifically, we have immense opportunities because it's not a surprise for maybe people in the room to hear me say this because my colleagues have been public about it. We don't have a functioning addiction treatment system. Um, it's, it's very shattered and broken and not collaborative and there's no cohesion between different pieces. So we have the opportunity to really build that piece. Um, and, and I think that's where we see these 914 deaths also really highlights the untreated substance use disorders in our communities and, and, and across the province. And so if we can really work towards building a cohesive addiction treatment center where we can gap that piece from evidence to practice and we can train healthcare professionals, I think that's going to take us a long way, but that's one piece of the pie, considering kind of all of the other um, components around drug policy, surveillance. Um, uh, there's so many more. So. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm worried about that uh, interdisciplinary piece. Do we see any um, differences there currently, like in terms of uh, different groups 
being able to work with each other well, or is that uh, been going pretty smooth as a whole? Sorry, the, the question was around interdisciplinary pieces? Yes. Okay. Our, um, uh, of course, that's something always to be worked on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the current state of the interdisciplinary work around addiction? I think there is some pieces going. Again, with the, my sort of more narrow focus on health, I think we're, we're doing a better piece in things like the fellowships where we bring interdisciplinary groups to learn together um, is a real opportunity um, to have healthcare providers really working. And I know the province is working towards these sort of primary care homes. It'll be primary care home hubs that work with interdisciplinary models and cares of teams. Um, and I think there is some good work that's been happening, I guess, in terms of law enforcement and really ensuring that people that use substances, as Pauline said, families, healthcare providers, and everyone's at the table. But I think we're just at the very beginning of really figuring out how to do that because in, I think with substance use, we've been out there sort of shouting each other down in the media for so long in terms of our different little silos that we're working in is that we really need, we really need to, and my colleagues say this, is not really waste a good crisis and we really need to all get together um, and we need to push towards this because like one death is too many, but 914 is just unacceptable. Well, and I think um, part of how you have helped us as well is looking at our curriculum even for pre-licensure. I appreciate the need for specialty nursing, but I think every nurse needs to know the foundational knowledge, and so getting it into the competencies, having these webinars are all key ways mm -hmm. to bring that up. I, I know the pharmacists are out there as the most accessible health professional, but really it's your nurses mm -hmm. that are going to touch most broadly um, families, communities, and the healthcare system potentially mm -hmm. down the road. So I do think there's an academic component yeah. that it does involve the fellowships, which is beautifully bringing together the interdisciplinary uh, groups. And I'm just really grateful. Was it Evan at the time? Whoever really pushed to get nurses involved mm -hmm. initially, yeah. because there was funding for physician residents for this specialty. I think it was David, actually. David Byers so at the table, yes. That. Um, that said we need nurses, nurse practitioners, and fundraising to make this happen mm -hmm. while simultaneously looking at our schools of nursing curricula yeah. to see where it could be embedded. Yeah, and it's been great to have that support, but it's still a struggle and we really have to like fight as nurses to like hold that space and hold right. that sort of our voices and, and that has been challenging. Um, but but it takes nursing leaders and, and to hear the voice and, and even to add to that, you know, Pauline and I go to this Immersa conference, which is this interdisciplinary conference every year, and I was just telling her on the way up here, people heard about this fellowship, and because it's the first one in North America, they were kind of floored, and then all of the physicians were kind of thinking, well, this is a big deal, like, people are paying attention to this, this is important, addiction nursing is important, but sometimes it takes something like that to get people's attention, so we really have to use everything that we can and all the tools we have at our disposal. And the op-ed and the social yeah. media and um, the research publications. I didn't see your name on that one that was flashed up there, but I'm thinking you are all part of the team. So it's good to get nurses' voices there. So can we do one more round to say thank you so much? Thank you.